Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of All In the Mishpacha. Here you see it, the cover of the latest Mishpacha, Mandy Hershkowitz. I, I never heard, I never knew who this person was. I think I've heard his name. A Journey of Discovery with music producer and band leader. He does a lot of things with music. He's Hasidish from Monroe. Um, not familiar with him too much. The article, was, the article about him was pretty boring, so I stopped reading it. I want to talk today about <clears throat> this article, Voice in the Crowd, by Yisrael Besser, who I believe is the best writer this magazine offers. Here's a picture. I don't know if you've ever seen him before. Um, he seems like a guy I would actually want to meet one day. I would like to meet this guy. Apparently does interviews, not as well as me, but it would be interesting either to interview the guy or to be interviewed by him. He's an MC also, so that's also in my category of, you know, profession. So, <laughs> I mean, I do it all. But uh, <laughs> he writes something which, <laughs> when I first read it, I said, I completely disagree with him. But after thinking about it, I actually agree with him um, in one sense. Um, it's called titled Extremely Normal. Um, I'll start it off. He says... So a two-page article. I was once fortunate enough to work in the gedolim slash inspiration slash biography industry. I often hear the add-on when discussing a great person, quote-unquote, but don't worry, they were normal too. Whatever the attribute being mentioned, extreme generosity, concentration, diligence, selflessness, seriousness, there is always that disclaimer. Yes, he slash she was extreme in that way, but don't worry. The implication is... Extreme is bad, normal is good. Which leads me to think the fact that it has to be said that de rigueur apology means that we don't really have a balanced view of balance. This will sound preachy, but bear with me. There is no such thing as a normal for a Torah Jew. There is only Shulchan Aruch, end. As country Yossi wrote years ago, paraphrasing a secular song, Oh, once a year I twirl a chicken over my head, and wouldn't it be that bad if it were dead? And there's a time when I go outside and burn my bread, because I'm a Jew, I do that too. Once the Shulchan Aruch rules, that becomes normal. He quotes a short story over here about Roshul Kamenetsky, one of the gedolim of this generation. Um, apparently, he was in some rich person's living room. A 10-year-old kid came to ask him a question. He said, I don't understand. The Gemara says if you embarrass someone, you lose your olam haba. Imagine someone who learned for 80 years straight. You know, he was davening really hard. He learned his best for 80 years. And one time he embarrasses someone in public. So he loses all his olam haba. Rashmol Kaneski responded to him, don't embarrass somebody. Meaning, what Yisrael Besser is saying, that that's the halacha. The Gemara says that, just don't do it. Because it's true. He basically was saying it's true. The Gemara is the truth. You know, he mentions that the, the Rosh Mokoneski's wife gave him an answer. He said afterwards, you know, we say, everyone says before they go to sleep, they say they're Mokal people. You say, you know, Kriyash Palamita, you say that you're Mokal everybody. So he probably was Mokal, even if you embarrassed him in public. <clears throat> At the end of the story, he talks about here, this is... Um, One last unseasonably somber thought. I sometimes listen to children reminisce and reflect on their deceased parents, and I've noticed that often the attribute they are most enamored of, the one they repeat again and again, is the one that would be considered least normal. The never missing, or quote-unquote always saying, or quote-unquote wouldn't step in, or quote-unquote every Shabbos and else, what else was going on, or at least for my father and mother to talk about, he never said a word to Lashon Hara, is what lives on, celebrated in church by children and grandchildren, meaning that the not normal might just be the most normal. That's what people talk about. They talk about, you know, the guy died, he never missed a minion or something like that. We are too quick to mock the guy who takes off his glasses on the subway. Come on, you have to be normal. Or the guy who asked to switch seats on LL because according to his Messora, he isn't spiritually comfortable in his assigned seat. So, you know, apparently that's not normal. And he says, Purim marks the first yard site of a man who did it a different way. He had a beard when nearly every other bachar in the mainstream yeshivas at that time did not. He learned in a style that veered from the accepted path of those yeshivas and maintained a schedule and lifestyle that transcended the outer limits of normal. You know the end of the story? Rav Chaim Kanievsky became Rabban Shalkol Yisrael, the most beloved, treasured, revered, godel, a yid from who all the normal people sought comfort, advice, blessing, and direction. Maybe, just maybe, this message too lies in Purim revelry, costumes and joyous singing. 
so unlike the decorum and sobriety of the rest there. Maybe a perm spirit is another way to bring us to a point of Adel Yoyah to be normal and not normal. To show us that when the Shulchan Aruch says to do something, quote unquote, more than one is accustomed to, are you not normal? Then that is healthy, perfect, and stable. There, right there, is exactly where you want to be, Lachayim. So when I, I read this article, you know, my natural reaction to this was, I mean, yeah, <laughs> uh, they're right. You have to be normal. It's very important to be normal, you know. I've heard this all from my Rebbeim. Or it's not just, you know, about other people talking about Gedolim. I heard this from my Rebbeim. I heard it. Reacted for you many times. You have to do this to be normal. Moshe Weinberger from Ish Kodesh. You have to be normal. You know, all, all my rebbeim were always teaching me, and they're always trying to show. You know, they did acts in their house. I was in their houses. Um, I was with them. They did things that try. You know, Rav Israel Belsky you talked about. And he would smoke a cigar um, in his house, trying to be normal. He he talked about he would go on trips with the the boys at the camp of Guda wearing a yellow bathing suit. You had to be normal. All the gadolim that I was around, I was around a lot of gadolim, um, you know, and they always impressed upon me. Sometimes they actually said it, and sometimes it was very evident from what they were trying to show me that it's very important to be normal, just like everybody else. Of course, you, you know, have to keep halacha, and you should try as much to learn as much Torah as possible, and as much Yerushalayim as possible, and the daven as well as possible, because all these gadolim were very good at those things. However, it's also important to be normal. And I said, that's all my rebellion told me. I don't agree with that. <laughs> you have to be completely normal, not just half normal, right? You have to be, yeah, right? I mean, up until four or five years ago, I agree with my rebellion. That, that was the story I had. But over the last four or five years, specifically I got married. Because once you get married, you know, I believe a lot of the messages that carry Judaism um, imparts to the younger generation is really really good for people that are not married for children or young adults who are not married because young adults you have so much time to you you have so much time why why are you sitting around wasting your time on your stupid phone go learn torah they're right go learn torah go daven you know give meaning to your life make meaningful decisions in your life give important decisions to make decision making is very important don't neglect the chirakafshas do be someone who tries to act properly, you know, not to get angry and things like that. And try to be someone who's a fair person, you know, has quote unquote good midos. Um, these are important things and they're really on target for this. You know, I don't believe so much in college education. I don't think that's so necessary to be honest, especially nowadays in the world, you know, the high paying jobs are college education is a hindrance. You know, you have to pay back a debt also. It's not even lucrative to be a doctor anymore or to be a lawyer. In this world with inflation, you gotta, you got to be in tech. you got to have a startup. I spoke about last week about Dave Ramsey Analyze. I said, you got to be an employer, not the employee. you got to be with a startup. you got to have a business. you got to have a real estate portfolio, a stock portfolio. you got to try to make it big, especially if you want to succeed in the from Jewish world. Because you have to be, as I said last week, the article stated, in the top 2 or 3% of earners in all of the world in order to make it, just make it financially as a from Jew, in America at least. So that that's really, you know, so at the end of the day, for someone who, who's, who's, who's not married, it's really good advice. Once you get married, right, it doesn't add up anymore. It doesn't add up. The color lifestyle... Is really for children. That's really what the call of lifestyle is. Is for children. And you know, this is really inspired when I, I was a young avrich. I mean, I'm only married a little more than almost six years, five and a half years. And my first couple of years, I was learning basically in the mirror as an avrich. And every week, I would see, you know, signed. Every other day, I would see a new sign go up. This person got into an accident. He needs forty thousand shekel to pay for the damage that they did to the other person. Or this person's marrying off their 10th kid. They need 100,000 shekel. Go to Aaron David in the mirror and you know give your money to this person every day. And I'm like, hey, these guys are rich. They, they know they're having children. They're having 10, 11, 12 children. They know they're gonna have to marry. They want their kids to get married off. They want to marry off their children. Why are they still sitting at the age of 50 in the colo? Because all the gadolim say, you gotta learn, you gotta learn, you gotta learn. Be an for the rest of your life. To the point that it's looked down upon in the society that I live in that if you're someone who's not in learning, you know, 
it's the best possible thing is to be an Avrich in Kol, just learning. You know? If he's a Rosh Hashiva, that's also very, you know, honor. But if he's someone, you know, who is a Rebbe, you know, he's a Rebbe, he's a good Rebbe, he teaches Torah, and of course in his free time he's learning. He's got to be learning, right? That's the most important. The teaching is not as important. Learning is more important than teaching. Even though all the Mars and Perkevas say teaching is more important, but you know, Luminas Lamid, right? Lumina Lishmar Velas is the best. But you know, <clears throat> and you hear all about that. And if someone has busy working, yeah, 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 yeah. But they get up early for Dafyomi and they learn every single minute they have, you know. That's well I hear all of you. You gotta be learning, learning. I heard it from the rabbi here, the rabbi, the shul. He gets up, he says, We have a Masorah from all the Gadolim, that our job, and he's talking to people who are married, everyone basically sitting there was married, is to sit and learn. Sit, sit and learn. Where do you get your money from? Other people. You go to America. I have a brother-in-law. He goes to America. He loves going to America. Why do I go to America? By himself. What's what's good? He goes to people's houses. You know, he just goes to America to raise money for his family. He doesn't work. You know, maybe he does some small things on the side. He volunteers for other things. You know, he should take money. But the way he he, he supports his family is he goes to Americans. You know, he happened to have some connections with. Uh, Gvirim, rich people in America. He goes to their houses, knocks on the doors, and they know him. And they write out checks to this guy just to support his family, a regular family. He's not even supporting, he's not even, you know, raising money for a yeshiva or a kolo. So <clears throat> it's so sad. I'm like, you don't feel guilty doing that? You just knock on people's doors and say, give me money? You can get a job yourself. He's an Israeli. He speaks a language here. For me, it's harder on American. I gotta go on YouTube <laughs> in Israel. It's not hard. It's not easy. But, you know, there's no even attempt. You know, there's no attempt. People don't even bother. Why bother? Even though all the Gemaras, Gadola Yige is cop of Yosem Yerushalayim, it's better to have to earn your own living more than Yerushalayim. Why are you sitting and learning Masilas Kisharim and neglecting the fact that you have to earn money? Right? You need to earn money to marry off those kids. Don't just ask for Tzedaka and then learn the Gemara and Brachos and Navav. The Gemara and Brachos, the of Brachos, the first Gemara. You don't see those Gemaras? You know, you don't see all Perky Elvis talking about? You don't see these things? It's all over, all over Shas. You know, all over. They always talk about these things. You know, Pshot and the Velda Vishukov, Al Torah Gavarabu. Go embarrass yourself. You know, skin an animal in, in, in the marketplace. You see a Rosh Hashiva do that? He go, he take off his frock and his Hamburg and, and go skin an animal. That's what the Gemara says you should do. Don't be a Rosh Hashiva. Don't go collecting to America and, you know, no, I'm collecting for a good cause to, you know, ensure that the, the Bachram are learning and the Avrechim are learning, and I'm going to learn and I'm going to teach them Torah because my yeshiva is unique. Because we teach Torah the better way than all the other yeshivas. Let's create a million yeshivas already to raise money for, right? And then he takes 49% for himself, for his own family. So this is, it's, it's not, it's an immature way, it's a childish way that somehow is inculcated into society over here. And for good, I mean, people call them parasites. People call them schnurs. And for for good measure, it's true, it's true. And when I read an article by Yisrael Besser, and I hear you know being normal is good, you know, and in my mind I'm thinking my Rosh Hashiva, right? My Rosh Hashivas or you know the gedolim that I was around, you know, they're all taking money from tzedakah funds. Maybe not directly to them. Maybe for their yeshivas. Maybe their institutions. Whatever they're doing. You know, they're getting paid through the institutions. You can't take money to teach Torah. The Gemara says that. You can't take money to teach Torah. So <clears throat> what are they doing? They know they read the same Gemaras. They know these Gemaras, but they ignore them because Yitzhah Hara tells them, go sit and learn. I think all the Gedolim, just everyone does it. You, you can't. It's cancel culture. You can't even say anything against, against these people. It's really cancel culture over here. Uh, I'll explain why in a second. So my impression when reading this is, yeah, those those people were like, sit and learn as long as you can, but be normal also. Or she was, be normal. Be a normal person. You know, do what everyone else is doing. I bet as manam, you play basketball, you know, with your white shirt tucked in, you know, <laughs> during, uh, but only twice a week, you know, three times a week. I don't know. You have some stupid stuff. And also, you know, you know Ben Azman, and when they go out to a restaurant, your family, you go with them, and, and you have you have the schnitzel, but you don't have the steak, you know. I don't know exactly. You know, so to me, it's like, no, it's a yes or no question. Either, you know, not just be normal, get a job and be really normal, not just act normal or talk normal. You know, when people start talking in conversation, you know, the rabbis talk about them. Yeah, they start you know, talking about, yeah, what's it like in business, the emails and stuff like that, you know, joking around about that, you know, like, like, like we're relevant to this conversation or, you know, like it's something that interests us when it doesn't, but just 
That was the impression I got. It's just act normal because you don't want to look weird. And really, what is that? It's just peer pressure. Right? You don't want to look different than if you think people are going to look down upon you. That's the type of normal that I'm conjuring up in my mind. You got to you got to act normal because all these gedolim and rabbanim, you know, were extreme people in in Judy, Judaism things, right? And learning and hasmada and you know tefillah and kabbalah and things like that. They were extreme people in teaching Torah and learning Torah and davening and staka and things like that. They were extreme, but they emphasize you have to be normal. So I'm reading this. And he's right. The author's right. Everyone says you have to know. But, but I'm hearing this from my rebellion. That's what they taught me. And so now at the point where I'm in my life, I'm like, no, you got to be really normal. you got to get a job. And you got to be like a regular person like everybody else. We just concluded my series today about, you know, marital intimacy. And I, the last lecture I gave was to discuss what the author made a mistake about fundamentally in his presentation of the matter in the book. And the fact that he said, yes, it's good to enjoy yourself in the bedroom, but... With a caveat, right? You're not supposed to enjoy yourself fully, like the Ravid says, and you're supposed to, and you're supposed to differentiate in the bedroom between imagination and what actually a need that you really have. So you have to be very careful. The gates are horror in the bedroom, so you can't really enjoy the bedroom fully, partially, right? It's not like the Shulchan Aruch says, right? I quoted today where the Shulchan Aruch says you have to be with fear and trepidation, and you should only do it like a demon is forcing you to do it, and According to the Shulchan it's a terrible thing. You shouldn't enjoy it. It's like Christianity, you know. And and the author says it's good, but with a caveat. And then my point was is that you got to make a decision. Is either it good or not good? Is he, is evil or not evil? Is enjoying the purpose or not the purpose? He says it's it's there. The enjoyment is there to assist you unify some spiritual concept, unifying the zchar and the keva, the male and the female, so you're a complete. The complete entity and the Shrina and Hashem comes when you're a complete entity. But the point is that my that the author didn't choose, you know. It's either good or bad. The Shulchan Aruch is not so bad. He chose. Right? It's it's better to make the wrong decision than not, not making a decision at all. To create some third category or something like that, some mishmash, and the person says, is it good? Yes, but only if, right? So you're creating a third category, a new category. And I explain for two reasons there's a problem. One problem is that you're failing to make a decision. Right, so you can never do tshuva. You can never repent because you're gonna make all calculations and machinations to, you know, prove why you're right. But you know, you never took a side of the debate. You failed to make the decision, so you can never do tshuva. You can never repent from that because if I make the wrong decision, I'm still in the, in the ball game. Okay, you proved to me that I made the wrong decision. I'm sorry I did that. I'll move to the right decision. But if you're not in the ball game, it's over. And the second part is once you fall into that middle category. This is my, my one of my Rosh was at the middle of Veg. He talked about it in learning, you know, and it was really part of his, you know, idea of Hashkafa, is that, you know, his ideology in Judaism, is that there's a, a third category, some sort of balance, like these people are talking about being normal. You know, there's no, there's cancel culture. You can't argue on that because they made up their own system, right? Wait, you said it's bad. No, no, I said it's good. You said it's good. No, I said it's bad sometimes. Right? So you can never win with these people. The cancel culture. It's cancel culture. It's, it's sort of like if you bring the politics nowadays, you know, there's no men and women. There's, you know, whoever you identify as. It's a third category, right? There used to be men or women, right? There's one or the other, right? But now I can identify as whatever I want. So, yes, I could be a man in certain circumstances, or I could be a woman in certain circumstances. So you've taken a new thing, which just doesn't really one of the choices, and therefore you're just going to... You'll, you'll cancel anyone else who says anything against you because you know deep down it's wrong because you didn't make a decision. The worst possible thing about Bechir Chavish is when you don't make a decision. It's better to make the wrong decision than to not make any decision at all. Some people say it's making a decision but not making a decision, but it's worse. It's it's a, a worse decision than not making a decision. It's it's weakness. It's not doing anything. So I want to agree with the author partially over here, with Yisrael Besser over here, in that his portrayal of some of the gadolim, and I think two gadolim he, he talks about over here are Shmuel Kamenetsky and Rav Chaim Kanievsky. Shmuel Kamenetsky and Rav Chaim Kanievsky really sum it up very well. These are types of people who really, in a sense, I don't know Shmuel Kamenetsky too much, but I know Rav Chaim Kanievsky a lot. There's so many stories about him. Is that the question was, do you right? Do you be normal or do you not be normal? And Rav Chaim Kanievsky, he didn't try to be normal. He wasn't trying to be normal. He, he just sat there and learned and learned and learned and learned, right? I heard about Steinman, right? On Shabbos afternoon, he would go and he would, you know, talk to his wife for five minutes and, and learn for seven hours straight on Shabbos afternoon. He made a decision. It's, it's a decision. He made a decision. You should always be learning, you know? 
And there are some people in the Haredi society that really believe that. They believe you should always be learning, just always learn. And it's not actually not so bad. It's not so bad. I mean, it's bad. It's the wrong decision. But what's worse is when you try to find the middle ground and you say, okay, I'm going to learn all day, but I'll try to act normal also. Because you'll never have do tshuva from that. You'll never be able to do tshuva, and you'll cancel anybody else who tries to oppose you in that. Rechana Gavsky was not normal. He just sat there and learned his entire life. Rosh Hashanah answer, at least, I don't know so much about his life, Shmuel Kamenetsky, but, you know, he's also someone who just, you know, it says in the Gemara this, this is what we believe, the literalism of the Gemara. You lose your Olam Abba, you lose your Olam Abba. You believe, literally, what the Gemara says. The Shulchan Aruch says, Marilyn, to see, it's a terrible thing. Don't make the Shukafo shade. It's like a demon forced you. It's a bad thing. It's evil. Uh, with Christianity, it doesn't matter. That's what the Gemara says. Literalism, we trust the Gemara. So, we're not going to think about it anymore, but that's our decision. But you can bring other proofs from the Gemara. What are this Gemara? This Gemara? You can talk about it. I can have a discussion about it. I can have a debate. It's open to debate. So what the author is saying over here is actually very meaningful, and he's saying that it's good not to be normal. If you're going to make that choice and you believe, now he says the Shulchan Aruch is uh, the the gauge of what's normal, and he's this he's 100 percent right. That's true. The problem is is that a lot of like the Gedolim like. From Chayyim and what they tell everybody else is you got to be learning all the time. That it doesn't say in Shulchan Aruch. In fact, the Shulchan Aruch says you have to you have to earn a living. It doesn't say you're supposed to be learning all the time. The Kovei Eitim Torah, right? The Shulchan Aruch says many places it doesn't say you're supposed to be learning all the time. This is a new thing in this generation, the proliferation of kolim that you're supposed to be learning all the time. That's not the view of the Torah. This is a, a new uh, view in Judaism. This is not so. I, I'm I'm very into that, right? I'm very into, even though I'm, my my life now is completely normal. I buy designer clothes. I want to eat good food. I want to enjoy everything in life. That's my goal in life to enjoy this world as much as possible. Do I not follow the Shulchan Aruch? I follow the Shulchan Aruch as much as I can. As much as I try to, but exactly what the Shulchan Aruch says. Don't add on to the Shulchan Aruch. When you say learn the whole day, that's too much. But at least you're making a decision. So it's it's not the worst. The worst is is when you're making a compromise. I'll tell you a story. About Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Yaakov Freeman, the main Rabbi. When he was much younger, I believe he was a bachar. He wasn't even married at that point. He was in a room. It was Shabbos afternoon. And I guess it was after the Shabbos. He was in a room. He thought he was by himself. Maybe he, maybe he was saying out, he was speaking out loud. So the person, maybe he knew there was a person there. He wanted the person to learn from him, which is very possible knowing him. But the point is, is that he was speaking to himself and he was learning. And obviously he's probably a little tired. Shabbos is afternoon, you're tired. You know, he just had a challenge. So he was saying to myself, himself, what should I do? If I continue learning, right? If I learn good, I'm able to learn good. That's a good thing. If I decide to go take a nap, a Shabbos nap, that's also a good thing. You know, but if I learn and I'm not, I'm learning shvach, I'm not learning well, that's not a good thing. So the point is he didn't make a decision over there. He said there's two good things. Like I was talking about this author in the, the living marriage, he, he says the world we view in terms of good and bad, not in terms of the truth and falsehood. Truth and falsehood tells me which one. Is it better to sleep or is it better to learn? Obviously, you know, learning when you can't learn is not a good thing. He, he, he knocked off, he did a filter over there. He took off the third possibility. The third possibility is not even really a possibility. It's either yes or no. Is it What's better to do on Shabbos afternoon? You're not married. You don't have kids to watch. You don't have a wife to speak to. What's better as a bacha? What should be learning or sleeping? We know Shabbos is day of Manucha, you're supposed to rest. What's the answer to that question? So he didn't even give an answer to the question. He said both are good. When, when you're division good and bad, so this is good and this is good. But you haven't answered the question. You haven't made a decision. You're balancing normal and, right, sleeping is good because it's normal. Learning Torah is good because it's the Torah, it's a mitzvah. But you're not answering the question, and that's the problem. In fact, I remember when I was younger, I was a bacha in the mirror. You know, after the chalun, it was 10 o'clock in the morning. The mere Shabbos meals ran from like 9.45 to 10.15. Everyone was out. It was like a buffet there. Take some chalun, you leave. I would go up to the Ezra's Nashim, I think, and take a Mishra Bura out, and I would try to learn. And usually I fell asleep, and I slept like an hour on the shtender, which for me was a lot. I didn't realize I slept and made Shabbat, and then you're able to sleep more. But I continued learning. I always learned, you know. I believed in that. I always learned. When I got married, I had to do a complete recalculation. I'm like, wait a second. Okay, I got to... You know, earn money. I have to try to earn money. I'm not earning so much money right now, but I need to earn money, or at least get myself in the direction where it's possible that I can earn money. Um, I'm not going to be one of these Avrechim in the mirror that are going to, in 30 years from now, begging Rav Aaron David to collect money for them for the, their, their 10 kids' wedding. I'm not going to be like that. You know, I don't want to have 10 kids. 10 kids is too many. I have to support all of them. 
You know, these are decisions you have to make when you get married. You know, uh, and and the other concern also is you have a spouse now that you have to spend time with. Okay, so you want to spend time with her, you'll give her some time, right? You'll do Ona for her. No, but if if she's really going to enjoy it, right? If she's really going to be happy, you have to also be there. You have to be present. You're enjoying it also. That's the truth. And and that it begs the question. Wait a second. So spent, um, a lot of time, my my night stater is a no go. Even though some people say night stater, night of course, night stater is for sure a no go. I realize that intellectually, you know, people come home from work, they're with their family at night. They don't go out and learn night stater. I mean, some people work and learn night stater. I don't I don't agree with it. You night stater, you got to be home at night with with your wife, spend time with your wife, and your family. So. <clears throat> It was a non-starter when I got married. Before I got married, I'm like, for sure, night night and I know by you know, Rosh Hashiva, you paid extra money for people who come to night Seder, incentive. But I said, it's a non-starter. I realized that immediately. And all of a sudden, these things that, you know, learn all the time, dive as long as you can. Wait a second, I have a spouse already. I, man, I started having kids. I have kids to take care of. I've helped my wife in the house. Can't make her crazy. She has to have a life also. So, you know, I'm like, my time is so constricted, and I can't be learning all the time. So I had to recalculate my whole life, you know, because it made a lot of sense, and it was true. A lot of the things that Haredi society teaches are very good for a person who's not married. I didn't get married until I was 35. So a lot of I had a lot of free time. I had so much free time. Now I have no free time. I had so much free time, then spending my time learning. Why not? That's what you're supposed to be doing. Well, you know, when you need to earn money, you come with some business. You get a YouTube channel. So, <laughs> so you know, but my whole perspective on life changed because now spouse wife, money, kids, all these things, you know, things that never would have, you don't understand until you actually get married and have kids. So that changed my perspective at all. So I you, I had, the, I, I always made the decision. Until then I made the decision, always Torah as a buffer. When I got married, I had to recalibrate and say, yes, when you're not married, only Torah. But when, if you can't, meaning it's a lot of people can't sit and learn. I was able, I'm a very studious type of person, able to sit for a long time. And concentrate on my learning, and I was intellectually motivated, intellectually stimulated. That's why I just great uh, Ian Shiram and Dafyomi Shiram and, and Torah Shiram on the channel. But um, when I got married, I'm like, it has to stop. It doesn't make sense to go anymore. It can't go anymore. It can't go on anymore. That's not the right way. I realized that it was it was so obvious to me. So because I had made a choice earlier, right? I didn't go take a nap on Shabbos afternoon. I realized you can learn Torah. That's the right decision. So I was able to jump. I realized it was wrong. So now let me, the other decision is that the point of life is not to just learn total all the time. It's to enjoy life, right? But if you're sort of in the middle where you're saying, I'm going to do as much Torah, even after I get married, but I'll try to act normal so my wife won't realize or I'll fit in or whatever reason. I, I think people say that be normal. They don't even know what they're talking about. They're doing it. I think it's just embarrassed to, to be different. Right? I guess he wasn't embarrassed. But Shmokoneski wasn't, it's not embarrassed to be different. You're different, you're different. But the point is, is that you have to make a decision in life. And what the author is saying over here, meaning Rav Chaim Kanievsky and maybe Rosh Mo Kamen get on so much about his life, but they're making a decision. The decision is, even after you get married, all Torah, all Torah, and the cold, fine, you make a decision, you make a decision. That's the wrong decision. But you could do tshuva, it's possible to do tshuva. But what the author is saying is to be normal and to be doing extra Right, extra, extra, extra. Never speaking lashon hara. Never missing a minion. Never always learning every second available. Giving as much stuck as possible. You know, so those things combined with normal is the worst because it's not making a decision at all. That's not making a decision at all. It's saying, yeah, there's truth here and there's truth here. So I'll make up some sort of mishmash and balance over here. You know, to 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 make sure really they're doing it so people won't say, oh, he's different than everybody else. But the truth is, they make the decision. Don't be normal or be completely normal and be like everyone else in the world, some Jews and also all the secular people in the world who are not Jewish, who are running after pleasures and running after, that's the basic premise of life, right? We run after pleasure, we avoid pain. That's what human nature is. So you try to, to live a life. Obviously, you, if, you, if you're an intelligent person, you can't just say, I'll do whatever I want because especially when you're married, there's you know, constriction over there. You can't, you know, do something you want at the expense of somebody else, your wife or your kids. Yes, yes, there is times that you have to, you know, put your put your, yourself first. You should put yourself first as a husband. You should be number one, your wife number two, kids number three. But you also have to worry about other people. So not a, it's not so black and white always. But the choice should be should be clear. The choice should be clear that I'm doing it to be completely normal. 
So either you be normal at all or be completely normal. Two options. And the author says he's talking in the from world, the Haredi world. There's no completely normal in the Haredi world because that's really the secular or maybe the modern Orthodox world. I don't, modern Orthodox world is really, you know, I guess Dati Lumi is where I really identify the most, even though I'm technically part of the Haredi world. Um, you know, and, and, and the reason is modern orthodoxy as opposed to secularism says we believe in the Shulchan Aruch, we try to follow the Shulchan Aruch, but we try to follow in the most simplistic way possible, whatever the halacha is. And when there's a machlokas, you know, the Gemara says already, there's two opinions, two legitimate opinions. You go with the more mekel shita, the Gemara says many times in the Gemara, that the mutter opinion, the mekel opinion, is the more correct opinion because they're willing to go out on a limb and tell you what they really believe. It's very easy to be machmir, the Pnei Yeshua. It's very easy to be machmir. Right? Everyone can be machmir, machmir. Everyone is Yerashamayim. We're afraid we're going to get punished in Gehenna. But to be mekel, you must be really accurate. If you're willing to go on a limb and say it's mutter, you're telling the truth. So <clears throat> that's really um, that's really what, 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 what really I follow in life. Enjoy as much as possible. But there is, I believe in the Torah Shavu Alpah. I believe in the Torah Shavu Alpah. And the Torah Shavu I believe in Judaism. I'm a believer in Judaism. And the reason I believe in Judaism is because I know the physical world is not the end. Because I'm very in touch with the metaphysical side of myself. And you, your brain is not physical, right? Your decision-making is not physical. We know there's something else underneath the surface, underneath my face, whatever, my body, spiritual, whatever, metaphysical, that we can't touch, we can't feel right now. But there's something there. So that's that's the reason I believe in God. I believe in Judaism. It makes the most sense to me, Judaism. Judaism makes a lot of sense. And it's starting to make a lot more sense now because I realize once I have that perspective that the Torah meant... All the mitzvahs are to enjoy the world. I have a different perspective on mitzvahs. Check out all my Ian Shiram on Gemara, on Mishnayas, on Shulchan Aruch, where I give you a glimpse of the Torah. You know, it's all normally interpreted in a weird way. We do weird, wear boxes on our head, on our arms. These are weird things to do. We're making a sukkah on sukkahs when it's freezing outside in New York. What the heck are these things talking about? They're, 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 they're hurtful. They're harmful things. Eating matzah. Who likes to eat that matzah? It's like a cracker. You have to eat so much cracker. You eat the three huge crackers to be Yosef Kazayas on Pesach. You know, so follow the Shulchan Aruch because the reason I believe in it is because I believe the truth to it. I don't believe in the literalism of it. I don't believe it's literal, even though the Shulchan Aruch codifies it in a literal way. But I believe there is truth to it, and hopefully one day we'll get to that truth. And I believe that the Torah is unique because it gives... You know, there's so many secular people over there who know, I want to enjoy the, mo- the world as much as possible. They're very unsuccessful doing it. They turn to drugs, suicide, cheating on their wives. They can't do it in the right way. The Torah tells you the right way to do it. We haven't got that yet. Mashiach will guide us and will tell us how to do it in the right way, how to enjoy the Torah. The Torah really means to enjoy everything in the world. It's telling you the way to enjoy the world. That's, the Torah. That's just the basic of the Torah. I know that now. Um, but I'm not there yet because I don't understand all the things of the Torah because I'm traditionalist. These are the things we've been following for generation to generation. I follow the Shulchan Aruch, but you're not going to follow it in, you'll follow it in a simplistic way. Exactly what it tells you to do, that's it. If there's two opinions, you go Lakula, you go your Mekel, you do it exactly as it's supposed to say. I'll give you another example. Unfortunately, there was a very startling incident here on Shabbos, um, to me at least. Most people just didn't think twice about it, but this past week was part of Zachar. And they had, I found out later, they only had part of Zachar read for men during the, they have three minyan for men over here, Vasikin, like a 7 o'clock and an 8.15. I went to the 8.15 minyan. <clears throat> the rabbi, apparently, I found out afterwards, did not want to have a Kriya Satora for women for Parsha Zachar, uh, even though it's a machlokas in the post when the women are chayev. And if you ask most Rabbanan, they tell the woman you have to go. It's Savag Dal Raisa, L'Chumra, woman, Right, maybe it's Zaman Grama, maybe it's not Zaman Grama. The woman have to hear Parsha Zohar. At least Los Sishkach is, is a lav. You can't, it's not Mitzvah's essay, she has one going to lav. So they have to hear Parsha Zohar, at least it's a suffix. What the rabbi said, he doesn't feel, since it's a suffix, he doesn't feel right taking out a Sefer Torah a separate time just for women. So, therefore, what? So, therefore, women, like my wife, who has four kids, four kids, the oldest is, is not even five yet. Right? Four young kids has to go over here with the kids. I'm in school at 8.15. I'm not waking up by seeking. I got to go. I'm going to 8.15. So I'm in Minion. There's no one to help her with the kids. She has to go bring all the kids over here and keep them quiet. And the worst part is that they, they write a time, 9.30. So if it started with 9.30, 9.35, okay, five minutes to keep the kids quiet. The problem is, is that before the Kriyas, some rabbi, not the rabbi, the shul, a different rabbi gets up 
and he starts preaching for 15 minutes about the importance of the mitzvah of Parsha Zohar. And I talked to my wife after, you know, the kids are shouting, the kids are screaming, she has to give them rice cakes. It's terrible, you know, and the kids can't be, if, they, if any of the kids utter a peep, you know, all the men will kill them, you know, literally for, for ruining their Parsha Zohar. So they have to keep the, they, they get there at 9.30, like the sign says, and they have to wait 15, 20 minutes till it starts, which is so sad. It's so sad. And first of all, th this person should be speaking for 15 minutes. No, should know, realize there's a lot of families like that. And the other problem is that there's no, he could, the other way of solving this is having later at 10.15, after the minion's over, a Christmas door for the woman, so I can go home and watch the kids. And my wife can go hear Parsha Zohar because it's Avigdal Raisa. So the point is, you didn't make a decision over here. But the Torah tells you to make a decision. So I go to you go to Chumrah. Okay, so I go to Chumrah. So if it's okay, to, if a woman's going to ask you, do I have to hear part of Zachar? The answer is always going to be yes. So that should be enough of a reason to bring out a Sefer Torah. Right? Bring out a Sefer Torah later. You should bring the Sefer Torah later. If you're going to paskin that they're Mechuyuf, so is not a suffix anymore. Don't treat the Torah as suffix anymore. The, the Torah told you how to rule in a Torah's vada, in, in a definitive way. So bring out the Sefer Torah. Have a separate read, reading for the woman. And the worst part of that, this is an incredible story. During the Torah, before the Arshad Zaka was read, the rabbi who got up to speak, he said, not only do you have to listen to every word of Arshad Zaka, you have to listen to the brachos. You have to be guilty with the brachos of Arshad Zaka. Now, any, it's like a non-starter. Like, people who learn of Arshad Zaka, you have to hear the words of the Torah. The brachos that the, the person who's getting the aliyah makes, brachos on the Torah, what does that have to do with the mitzvah? So some achronim have said suggested the Torah suffix. Maybe it's like Birchas Hamitz for the bracha before and after. I'm adding this on. So let's say legitimately it's a suffix. It's not more than a suffix in the post, but it's a suffix. A bracha is derabbanan. So the correct interpretation is suffix derabbanan lekula. Don't start preaching to everyone. You have to hear the brachas. And what happened? They're saying the brachas. The bracha. He said the brachas before. He said part of zacha. Everything. The bracha afterwards. In the middle of the bracha. A woman, I don't know, in the woman's section, she fainted or something happened, and they told the man, the man said, and then one man shouts out, Hatzalah, Hatzalah. You know, the woman was in either fainted or, you know, critical condition. I don't know exactly what happened. And the minute this person opened his mouth and said, Hatzalah, Hatzalah, everyone, shh, 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 you know. And he's trying to get the awareness of doctors over here to help this person that could die theoretically over here. And people are saying, shh, shh, you know why? Because the person who got up before, people don't know the halachas about it. They told them. They tell them, you have to hear the brachos. You have to hear the brachos before the brachos and mitzvahs. So I'm not able to hear the brachos and mitzvah after, which is a very doubtful in halacha. And it's derabon l'kula. The Torah tells you, be mekel. Don't tell people that because it's not the halacha. So you don't have to hear the brachos. Don't tell people, oh, let's do something extra over here. It's a neda, really, with it. Something extra. So by telling them that, you're leading to, it's a kula, it's a chumrah, the asa de kula, that there was, someone could have died because the person who's trying to say it solid was shushed. You know, it, it's, it was so sad. I'm thinking about this. I'm like, you know, that's the problem. The problem is, you know, you have to take the Torah with a grain of salt. And if you're going to follow the Shulchan Aruch, follow exactly the Shulchan Aruch. Don't add on. A, the, Torah tell, the Torah gives you ways of dealing with suffix. The doubt, right? There's no, there's no gray area in the Torah. The Torah tells you how to adjudicate every matter in Allah. If it's a Savak del Raisa, you're Machbir. If it's a Savak you're Mekel. I mean, you don't do it. Don't tell you do extra things that we don't have to do. It's like do raisa, do it. Or if it's two opinions that are do raisa, you go to the hetter, call it the hetter So <clears throat> there's clear ways of adjudicating cases of suffix. We've never been a case of suffix when it comes to Allah. And by telling people extra things to do and not following the simplistic explanation of the Shulchan Aruch is really a, a disservice to everybody. It's a disservice to the people who are telling people and the people that are following them blindly oftentimes. And it's very sad to see. So, in summary, the, the author of this article, he's writing a Haredi paper over here, Mishpacha. He's making the right decision, meaning he's making the better decision. The better decision is, forget about being normal. If you believe the way of the world, even after you get married, just sit and learn Torah, just sit and learn Torah. And don't try to be normal. Don't have to be normal. You don't have to be normal. Be chasidish. Be chasidish. You know, do everything different. Everything has to be different. You have to live in a shtetl, live in Borough Park. You have to only do business with Jewish people. You don't eat together with your, with your with your wife at the table, the Shabbos table. Do everything differently. Be everything, everything differently. Speak Yiddish, whatever. 
Okay, you made a decision at least. Made a decision. I think it applies to every aspect in life. At least you're different. At least you can talk to that person. The reason you can't talk to Hasidim is because they're dependent on the Rebbeim. They're, you know, and the Rebbeim are, you know, they're the ones who are, you know, in that balanced, suffolk, gray area world where they're not really earning. The Hasidim earn their living. Most Hasidim work. They earn, they're grown ups. They, 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 they work. They support a family. Oftentimes some of them are very wealthy. But, you know, the Rebbeim don't work. The Rebbeim have their rigorous schedules where they, they get. You know, bracha, they give advice and brachas of people. I don't know where the money comes from. Obviously, they so some of the Hasidim give them money, help them, which is really stuck on money. So they're living sort of this balance, this gray area over here. But the point is, is that if you're not going to be normal, don't be normal. Be completely not normal. Uh, that's better than being very, very from, but being normal. Because why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? You're, you're, you're creating a third category, and you're avoiding making a decision, you're creating cancel culture with this, and you'll never get to the right decision, which is to be completely normal. That's the right decision. To be, not to be also normal, to be completely normal, to get a normal job, and to enjoy the world. And the Shulchan Aruch, I believe you should follow. Simplistically, very simplistically, don't search for Chumras. Do it in the, the, the simplest possible way. And unfortunately, a lot of times, people don't know the Halakhas, and they ask Rabban, and the rabbis that know how to be maker are the best rabbis in the world. Because the Gemara says, hopefully you should find a rabbi who knows, who understands this lesson I'm telling you, this share that I'm telling you, this share, this <laughs> this um, show that I'm telling you, whatever I'm telling you over here. They understand this message and they follow the Shulchan Aruch in the most simplistic way possible until we know exactly what the mitzvahs are. Instead of the mitzvahs being something which are you know, hard to fulfill and difficult to fulfill and painful oftentimes to fulfill, they'll be enjoyable. And then you'll be machmir that you should enjoy it as much as possible, right? Matzah, right, is, you know, there's different shiur on how much matzah you have to eat. So no one likes eating so much matzah. But what if you told me the mitzvah of matzah was talking about something else? It wasn't about eating the crackers. It was about eating something else, which was enjoyable. It should be machmir, that's the biggest shiur. But that'll be the time of Mr. Mashiach. I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you in the next one.